All right, I'd like to invite uh, all the speakers from the morning session to come up and we'll have a question and answer period. If you wrote questions on your cards, uh, please, I'm not sure, Hip, can you gather them and anybody else in the back just gather the cards and I'll bring them up and kind of MC it. If anybody's bold enough and you want to ask a question now directly, just grab one of the microphones and um, you can uh, ask uh, a question or we can pass them out, whichever works easier. You want to go? Yeah, great. I don't know if I can get it out of there. There we go. See if it's on. And we're on. With regards to Are we on? There we go. With regards to radiation, uh, those of my friends who have gone through uh, proton therapy rather than um, or x-ray have reported much better outcomes and a lot less side effects. Do we have any data on that comparing the two types of radiation? Jonathan? So we do have a, a proton radiation as part of the uh, UW SCCA. Uh, uh, it is one of the different forms of radiation. Uh, and uh, we are, there are great data right now to show that one is better than the other. Uh, and there are some nuances to proton therapy and the prostate itself uh, as to why it may or may not be better. Um, and the studies need to be ongoing to do so. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that later. But all the forms of radiation uh, carry uh, risks or side effects. I think an important point related to that is there may be very different types of patients that ultimately get proton radiation versus conventional IMRT versus surgery. So it's really comparing apples with oranges. And we're hopeful that the side effects are less. The concept is there but we're handicapped by not having good randomized trials to prove in any given person which side effects might be different. So it's a tough one. Do you uh, have long-term outcomes? Like, well, so there's a long-term outcome. Yeah, so the question is, are there long-term outcomes? There are long-term outcomes, but again, you're dealing with different populations of patients. So unfortunately, we've never had a randomized trial comparing surgery versus conventional radiation. <laughs> Con comparing that with proton therapy, et cetera. So we get these questions, honestly, every day in the clinic. What should I do? What are the side effects? And uh, side effects are also different depending on who you ask. If you ask a patient what the side effects were uh, in sort of an anonymous survey versus what they're reporting to their physician, that's different as well. So that's one of the reasons for the Empower kind of registry is to take this out of the equation. Great question. One study we're participating in with the Proton Center is to try to see an improvement in rectal side effects. Exactly. And the, but the, it's power to, to improve from a 3% problem to a 2% problem. So uh, conventional radiation is very excellent too. It's a question over here, I think. Is that right? Oh. Uh, Whoever has the microphone. Go, go for it right there in the red. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm currently on um, hormone therapy after having surgery and radiation. And uh, I, I was wondering about this uh, BRCA testing and other genetic testing because my father had it and my brother had prostate cancer. And I have two boys uh, who are in their 40s now. And I'm wondering at what, what, what point is my PSA comes out of this, you know, starts to rise again. Uh, should I get this genetic testing? I think it's a good question. I think um, I, I would be happy to see you in clinic. Um, we do have, you know, that's what the clinic is designed is to help figure out when it's appropriate. If there is a family history, I think that's often enough of a trigger to consider testing. Um, also men who have more advanced disease, because of the study data that I showed you, we would consider it and certainly offer it um, so if you have any questions, that's why we're here. Um, and so we invite you to contact me or come to clinic. Should, should I work through my doctor with that or just come to you directly? Um, either way, I can help facilitate that if, if there's barriers or obstacles, we can work with that. Or just kind of try to figure out a way to do that. Thank you. So we've got a couple of nutritional questions for uh, Miriam. Um, and we can zip through these, I think, uh, pretty quickly. There's a question about milk thistle being helpful. Should it be used? And is there an issue with Zytiga, which is a abiraterone or a CYP17 inhibitor? But I think the basic question is just milk thistle regarding liver protection. Any data as far as you know? So milk thistle can be purchased uh, over the counter as you know, sort of an herbal supplement. 
and we really have zero data on whether or not this is beneficial or not. So, so we don't have any evidence to support that that would be beneficial. Any evidence of turmeric being beneficial or dangerous, particularly at high dose? You know, turmeric is um, a, a spice that's used uh, quite often in uh, South Indian uh, cuisine, and many of you have probably had it. A lot of research uh, where they put turmeric onto cells or put turmeric into animals that have tumors shows quite a bit of benefit. Sometimes we can't always get the translation to humans, so we don't have da good data on humans with the tumor, but the data seem to be promising with the cell cultures and with the animals. And the last nutrition question, um, someone was advised to discontinue red meat even if it was raised without hormones or antibiotics and was grass-fed, is there any research suggesting that eating red meat should only eat it once or two times per year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there actually have been quite a few uh, well-done studies over the last several years on red meat and many types of cancer. Uh, the data are strongest for colorectal cancer that if people who eat red meat uh, four to five times a week have a greater risk of colorectal cancer compared to people who eat red meat, you know, maybe once a week or less than once a week. There's a little bit of data for prostate cancer suggesting the same. Um, so the general guidelines might apply. So what are the general guidelines? Probably eating red meat no more than twice a week and a portion size is about the size of a deck of cards or a little bit larger, a couple times a week, and, and probably no more than that. And I, I received one uh, nutrition question from someone in the audience, so I'll go ahead and answer that. That's right. yeah. uh, the question is, in the diet and nutrition arena, is there a benefit to fasting? And that's a really good question. A lot of people do have questions about that. I have a separately funded uh, NIH study that I'm conducting uh, here in this building down in our prevention center. And it's not specifically on fasting, but it's on eating frequency. So essentially we're testing in a clinical trial whether eating every two hours a day or eating sort of a standard three times a day is more beneficial for markers of health. We're not doing this in cancer patients yet. Sometimes we have to do these initial studies in healthy people before we take them into the patient arena. So we're about in the middle of the trial. Uh, this is among healthy people. Uh, so they're randomized to either uh, three times a day or what you might call a grazing meal pattern. So it's not specifically fasting, but it's eating at less frequent intervals. And we won't have those data for a few years. There is some very intriguing data in, in breast cancer patients. We're increasing the time of the overnight fast uh, to eight to 10 hours instead of having a, a bedtime snack. Uh, may be beneficial, but we don't have those data in prostate cancer patients yet. So a couple uh, questions around cancer genetics and then we'll get to this question over here for Heather. Um, how, do you, how does one proceed to get germline counseling and testing and how typical is it for a physician in the community perhaps to recognize uh, that DNA testing should be uh, you know, considered or proceeded with? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think there's a lot of um, re-education or um, additional education that needs to happen to raise awareness about that because this data, the New England Journal of Medicine paper that I showed, um, is pretty new and so the connection of family history and prostate cancer and BRCA type genes is very new. So it has been probably not percolated into the community as well as I think we can. And so all of you in the audience will be encouraged to, you know, I think the, the, the take home point is really to, to know that it is important to ask about family history, to be proactive about talking to your doctors. If there is uncertainty to really, to, to go and seek the counsel of a genetic counselor. And that is why we launched this clinic as a resource. There is a lot of, um, change a lot of uh, the field is shifting very quickly there's a lot you know there's consensus conferences going on to figure out how to adjust and incorporate this new information i don't think we've reached steady state yet and so i think because of that um you know just be aware that this landscape is changing quickly and that we are here to sort of help you out um, so if there is questions if i can be helpful i'm here um, but it is something we'll have to prod 
uh, people uh, further out who may not have heard this exciting news yet. Uh, I, I would say the, the best not to you, so you can, uh, so my email's on there, but also um, 206-288-8300 is a good place to start. So there was a question about if you only had a family history of a paternal grandfather having prostate cancer, is that a particularly high risk or should screening be done? And I would say you really need a much more detailed family history. I wouldn't say that a single individual by itself without knowing other information regarding was it metastatic prostate cancer, et cetera, that wouldn't immediately raise alarm bells, but Heather's point that you really need to take a much more complete family history of breast, ovarian, other cancers to understand predisposition and then maybe uh, guide therapy and risk. The point I also want to make is that even though I'm encouraging everyone to be very familiar with their family history, it is necessary, it is not sufficient. So there are people who we identify who have inherited cancer risk mutations who had no family history of cancer, and those are people who had advanced prostate cancer. So the take home point is we need to do it, but it's not enough. And so there are still going to be people who um, may be at risk, and that also we're investigating and, you know, uh, I think trying to figure out how to go about it in the right way is something that we're all working on very actively right now, but, but, but to know that even if you don't have a family history, there may be certain individuals, those particularly by the advanced disease, you may be appropriate to think about them. So we have a question over here, and then we'll get to this. This question is for Dr. Chang also, and it goes to the BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, if you have prostate cancer, you, you go for genetic testing, and you show BRCA1 or 2, what can you do about it, if anything? What, you should, what should you do? What shouldn't you do? What does it tell you? Great question. I think um, it really depends where we are. I think I, what I tried to, we, we're, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of research to be done. So in the advanced disease setting, we have new treatment options, really exciting. I think there will be more treatment options coming in the earlier phases of disease. So for example, at the time of diagnosis, you may be able to incorporate more aggressive curative intent treatment approaches that will hopefully improve the outcome. And then certainly, I think I hope I sort of shared the excitement about the potential for clarifying uh, screening in the at-risk men. So it really, I think, across the board has the potential for a lot of change and benefit. We haven't been just sort of getting started in that process, and so... So um, treatment may be affected by Treatment this may be affected, absolutely, but it depends yeah, where you are in your stage of, in your stage of care. Understood. Thank you. Over here. Okay, I've got three questions, if I may ask them very quickly. Um, does leakage or, or weak stream have any indication as to the health of your prostate? Uh, urinary symptoms typically aren't uh, a sign of prostate cancer. It can be in a very, if it gets very large, but it's typically not. There's typically lots of other factors at, at play for, for why someone has uh, frequency slow stream, and that can include dietary and, and other bladder, bladder specific aspects. So certainly something to go in and talk to your primary about and if need be come to your urologist and we'll be happy to help you. And BPH. Yeah. Okay. Hey, the other the other two is have there been any studies concerning acupuncture and its uh, effectiveness and and any studies on prayer? <laughs> so, I, so I don't know any studies of acupuncture, although I have a lot of patients that I end up referring for acupuncture. I do believe it, it's helpful, certainly, especially in cancer-associated pain, too. So, um, and we don't have studies about prayer, but I know it's not going to hurt. And so, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I believe in that, too. So I think, I think having a good spiritual support is very important for our, for our, for our survivorship, not just about cancer, but all aspects. Something we haven't talked about, maybe the last question, or go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'll wait. I was just, there was a question we haven't talked much about side effects of therapy and what can be done to mitigate side effects, for example, after radiation and surgery with urinary frequency, for example. Jonathan, do you have any comments about someone's who quality of life is impacted by getting up five times a night? Yeah, I mean, our various treatments can certainly have an impact on that, and Nola kind of addressed some of that as well. And again, I would highlight that there are many aspects beyond just the cancer itself that can, that can play into uh, your voiding, your bowel, uh, your sexual function symptoms. And so I really encourage you to, to, to talk to your doctor, uh, and uh, if, if you're post-treatment, talk to your urologist, radiation oncologist. There are many things we can do, uh, but it's, uh, again, it's a, a detailed history and, and exam is going to be needed. So there are things we can do to help 
is multifactorial, multiple reasons why these things can be affected. Last question before the break. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, directed towards the, the first speaker. Uh, limitations on multiple, multiple regression analysis. We see a lot of numbers and very confusing at best. And then the whole panel coupled with that is, is uh, as reported in us too anyway. Use of uh, a drug and hit with a laser that's killing the cancer in 50% of the sub, uh, subset of 400 patients. Has anyone heard about that? And in other words, you're talking about modalities that are available. Uh, you address the issue of the gene you know, sequencing. Is there something that we can do that's, the stats are a lot higher. 50% success rate with this uh, one research study is better than some of the stats that I'm seeing presented. Back to your point, okay. and that is the limitations of your findings. So, um, the, it's a it's a short question. It has a long answer. I'm going to give us a, a short answer. Yes. Since we're, um, so, um, I'll say that statisticians are probably the biggest skeptics. Every study that I look at, I, I just I don't believe until I see what they did, right? And I think that um, I think it's really important to recognize that um, it's complicated. Right, that getting the numbers right is it's very often um, there's no there's no single right way to do it, and that investigators have made a choice about how they're going to do their analyses and present their numbers, and um, you know you you I think skepticism is generally a good thing to have because um, uh, you know we, we we want to advance the field and. Um, you know, there's 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 just um, many um, there's many different ways to interpret the same set of numbers depending on who you are. And remember that um, newspapers want to sell newspapers, right? Um, always look beyond the headline, right? I've seen many misleading headlines that, and then if if it's a study that really impacts you, then um, it, you know, um, even go beyond the article. We can get we can get the original studies. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. I field field a lot of questions from patients about what 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 the what are the right numbers. And I'll just say that our mission, the mission of our lab, is to get the numbers right. So um, that's why we always try to go beyond the you know, below the surface and really try to understand them. But I do think that maybe. Um, always go, always looking not just that the headline is important and recognizing that newspapers want to sell newspapers and um, um, a little dose of skepticism is always, I think, healthy. So let, That's why we'll people let, don't like statisticians. Well, let's <laughs> Dr. Wright address the therapy question yeah, real quick. Lots of new exciting therapies coming out. We're part of the, uh, a, a huge site to do, uh, to identify and evaluate new treatments. So. Um, Small studies need, need larger ones to be done, and we're always looking for the next new treatments. So I guess we are aware of these things. I have one question here about whether or not someone qualifies for a specific study. And rather than address a specific question, I would say that studies have very defined populations, and please contact us, and we can help figure out whether or not uh, you do qualify for one of the studies. So we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, please share the refreshments and things, and come on right back so we can start with session two.